My brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Hello, my friend. My name is Duke Duvall. Welcome to another segment of Conquering Your Giants. My friend, I pray that as we are transitioning from Thanksgiving, and I hope that you were able to join me on Thanksgiving program and the one following where we were talking about contentment, but it's a good setup, isn't it, for us to be thinking about what we will soon be celebrating. And the reason I want to begin this countdown to Christmas in the form of talking about God's greatest gift is that you and I have to be more like a thermostat than a thermometer. What do I mean by that? A thermometer just registers the temperature of whatever is going on, but a thermostat controls the temperature. And I believe that there is a real window of opportunity every year between Thanksgiving and Christmas for people's hearts who have perhaps been more traditionalized, more homebound, uh, certainly during COVID, but every year people think about gathering at home around the Thanksgiving time of the year. In fact, many people prefer Thanksgiving to Christmas because Christmas has become so commercialized and so much about shopping and buying worldly gifts. And that's why I want to talk to you maybe this week and maybe even next week about God's greatest gift. I want to start with this premise, something that I came across that I think will set the foundation for us talking about what God has done, what the greatest gift God has given to you and to me. Think about it with these words in mind. Have you ever stopped to wonder what this life is all about? Why you're here and where you're going when your lease on this life runs out? Maybe you've been far too busy trying to reach your goal. So would you let me ask you kindly, have you ever really thought about your soul? You might reach the highest portals and all your dreams might come true. Wealth and fame may be your portion and success might shine on you. All your friends may sing your praises, not a care on you may roll. But what about eternity? Have you really thought about your soul? Don't forget, your days are numbered. And though you might be riding high, but like every human being, someday you're going to die. Your success and fame and glory won't be worth the bell you toll. So let me ask you again, please. Have you really thought about your soul? If you've never thought it over, please join me and spend a little time today. There's nothing more important that will ever come your way than the joys of sins forgiven and to know you've been made whole. So please, let's take a little time today and would you think about your soul? My friend, I want you to look at this very first scripture verse. It is our foundational verse in our countdown to Christmas as we think about God's greatest gift. 2 Corinthians 9, 15. Thanks be unto God for His unspeakable gift. Thanks be to God for his unspeakable gift. Now I want you to follow with me in this thought as we head toward having the most Christ-centered Christmas that any of us have ever experienced. Is that a worthy goal? Let me just start there. Maybe you're not thinking about that as such, but wouldn't that be not only something valuable to you, but valuable to those who know you. If you and I registered the most Christ-honoring, Christ-centered, Christ-filled Christmas that we have ever experienced. And if God should tarry, I pray that we'll be even more Christ-centered next year. But my friend, we all agree that there's room for improvement in your life and mine. We are all a work in progress. Paul would say, in effect, using modern words, I haven't arrived. Thank God I left, but I haven't arrived. 
I'm still working toward that high calling to which I've been called heavenward, and so are you, and so am I. My friend, the greatest gift that God has ever given us, of course, is His Son, Jesus Christ, and the sacrifice. But we would never have that sacrifice on the cross if it were not for Him being born and coming into the cradle. And so from the cradle to the cross and ultimately to the crown, we will be looking at this life, this solitary life, this most unspeakable gift of God. My friend, you and I need to think about this. When the world at large would cause us to think about all the other reasons for celebrating Christmas and buying stuff, you and I have to be that thermostat that registers a different climate, a holy climate, a climate that even if we are at odds with our own family members who want to make it a worldly Christmas, you and I need to do all that we can unto God to make it a Christ-centered Christmas. Why is it important? Well, I want you to take a look at our next scripture. Look on your screen. In Romans 1.21, we see why a gift from God is necessary. Because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain. They became vain in their own imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. My friend, you and I need to understand this and help others to understand it. That there is a judgment coming. And it's not going to be pretty for the majority of people born into this world. You say, well, Duke, that's pretty judgmental on your part. No, I'm just quoting from the Word of God. Jesus, in particular, would say the road that leads to life is very narrow. But the road is broad that leads to destruction. You see, when Jesus was raised to the newness of life, when He, on the third day, came back to life from the dead, it changed everything. It's the good news for those of us who are being saved, and it's the bad news for those who would have been better off to have what's called the doctrine of annihilation. Have you ever heard that? Big long phrase. Some people teach that today. They believe that today. In fact, sadly, there's an entire sect of Judaism that teaches annihilation. That when you take your last earthly breath, everything ends. You cease to exist. You talk to certain people about what life after this life means, and they are really talking about a memory. That eternal life is really being in the heart of your relatives. You no longer exist. You don't exist in heaven. You don't exist in hell. You just don't exist. You've been annihilated. But the Bible doesn't teach that. My friend, here's what the Bible teaches. And this is not what you would typically think of as a Christmas sermon, but perhaps it should be. We love to talk about that baby in the manger, and we'll get there. But why did that baby need to come? Why did the second person of the Trinity, God the Son, have to come from glory into this sin-sick world and take on human flesh and be crucified and then be raised to the newness of life and to ascend back into heaven? Why? Why did Jesus have to die? How did He become God's greatest gift. Well, I'll use a worldly example. In the studio with me today is my precious 95-year young mother. Ten years ago, when she was 85, she came and told my father, my two sisters, and me, I've just found out I have cancer. To make a long story short, my precious mother, now 95, at that time 85, went through two cancer surgeries, 
She went through 35 or 36 radiation treatments and five years of chemo tablets. Why? Because she believed that the cure was greater than the cancer. That the cure could in fact have victory over the disease. My friend, if in fact you've never had cancer, chemo tablets don't mean that much to you. Radiation treatments don't mean that much to you. Hearing that you have been freed of cancer doesn't mean much to you because you never were faced with that life-threatening disease. To put it in the realm of theology, the old country preacher used to say, you can't get a man found until you get a man lost. What's he saying? That in order for somebody to appreciate God's greatest gift, salvation in Jesus Christ, that man, that woman, that young person needs to be confronted with the truth that they, like all of us, have spiritual cancer. And it will kill us. And unless we come to God's greatest gift and receive that gift, we will forever be banished from His presence. And when 10,000 years in heaven have rolled by and we're singing that glorious song, in reality, what we sing now by faith, when we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. Those who end up in hell will have wished that Jesus never overcame death. Those who are tormented in hell will wish that the annihilation doctrine was true. And so would you, and so would I, if we were in the tortures of hell. We would wish that we did not exist. And the Bible even makes reference to Judas saying it would have been better that he never be born. My friend, we have God's greatest gift because we have man's greatest need. And here it is. In Romans 1, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath shown it unto them. What's being said there? And somebody might say to you, well, I don't believe what you believe. I don't believe that Bible stuff. I don't even believe there's a God. You'd have to say, dear friend, I can't believe that you believe that. Because the Bible says otherwise, and I must believe the word of God and not you. You say that you don't believe in God, but God says He has placed within your human heart the knowledge of Himself. And that if you press it down and suppress it, you're only lying to yourself. You might be attempting to lie to Him, but you cannot because He's God. Listen to it again. My friend, we're setting a foundation for God's greatest gift. And I pray that what it will do for you is what the cure for cancer did for my dear mother, that it became more meaningful to her because she was faced with cancer. She didn't ask for it. You didn't ask to be the great, 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 great grandson of Adam. You didn't ask to be infected with this disease called sin. But you are infected, and so am I. There is a disease. Now then, are you going to die in that disease? Or are you going to die in the cure? There's a broad way that leads to destruction, Jesus said, and many will travel on that road. Why? Because the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to those of us who are being saved, it is the power of God unto life. I want you to have the most Christ-centered, Christ-honoring, Christ-filled Christmas you've ever experienced. I want that for myself. But it starts with appreciating the gift. And we could never appreciate being saved until we can really understand how lost and how hopeless apart from Christ we would have been. And how apart from Christ, those who are apart from Him now, 
unless they repent, unless they turn from their sins to Christ, they will die in their sins and they will be lost forever. My friend, that might be somebody sitting at your dinner table. That might be somebody sitting on the same pew with you at church. That might be a customer. That might be a coworker. But because Jesus overcame death, so will every single human being be raised to the newness of life. And the Bible says either to spend eternity in the glorious presence of our Savior or to be banished from His presence and to be in the torture for eternity whereby you will wish that annihilation was true. I want you to understand, I want us all to understand, that this is a matter of eternal life and death. In Romans 1, verse 18, For the wrath of God, that word in the Greek language means punishable anger. Let me just stop and say this to you. If you are in the habit of going around to people saying, God loves you, I want you to rethink that. Because God has a punishable anger for all who are rejecting Christ. Now to be sure, there is a general sense of grace. And yes, I know John 3.16, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believes on the Son hath life, but he that believeth not, the wrath of God abides on him. My friend, you cannot arbitrarily say to anybody and everybody, God is pleased with you and where you are in life right now. Because if they are thumbing their nose at God, if they are rejecting them passively or aggressively saying, I don't trust you, I don't believe you, I don't want to have anything to do with you. It is not your place as an ambassador of Christ to tell that man a lie, that he's in good shape for eternity. You can't get a man saved until you let a man know that he's lost. My mother would never have gone in for two surgeries and 36 radiation treatments and five years of chemo tablets unless she had been convinced by her surgeon that there was a disease within her that needed to be eradicated. You and I have to be agents of truth if we are going to be agents of Christ. And here's the truth. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. For God hath shown it unto them. For the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. I want you to see that very verse on your screen from Romans 1. Take a look at this and just let it sink in for a moment. Because that, think about it, because that when they knew God. How do you know that they knew Him? Because God said they did. He had placed within their heart the knowledge of Himself. Because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful. So what was the result of that? but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. My friend, we're talking about the disease. We have to talk about the disease. If you want to try and tell everybody that if they trust Jesus Christ, they're going to have peace and comfort in life, they're going to have a big bank account, they're going to have no more problems, you're lying to them. And if they come to Christ 
because you've told them that they'll never be lonely again? If they come to the Lord Jesus Christ on the false premise that God will shower them with material blessings or any of the other lies that we hear being preached from churches that have nothing to do with Scripture, you're going to be an agent of untruth rather than an agent of truth. And if somebody comes to your Jesus because you've told them that life will be a breeze after they come to Him, then the first time that they are confronted with disaster in their life and a loved one dies or they have cancer, they will say, this Jesus has failed me. But you see, you have sold him under a false pretense. What they need to understand is that they are headed to a judgment. Somebody has noted that Christmas might be the most damnable time of the year. I've heard it put that way. This minister went on to say, why do I say it in such stark words? Because people recognize this time of the year, the birth of Jesus. But that's where it stops for them. They recognize that he was born, but they have nothing to do with his sacrifice. They have nothing to do with worshiping him as Savior and Lord. So they are perpetuating their own sin. They are, in fact, revealing what the scriptures have said, that they know that there is this historic figure named Jesus. My friend, the Jewish people know that. The Muslims know that. Even cults recognize this historic figure, Jesus. But you begin to talk to them about who this Jesus is, and we'll deal with this in another program. But if there's anything that is under such combatable circumstances today, the assailing of the divinity of Christ is taking place not just outside the church, but inside the church. Talking about Jesus as a prophet or a good rabbi or a good teacher, maybe even a miracle worker. Oh, but he, he wasn't crucified. That has nothing to do. That's a, that's a Jewish legend and a myth. My friend, that's the word of God. And this word is not like some buffet where you go through and say, I'd like one of these, but none of that. I'd like two of these, but none of that. You and I have to take this and we have to become students of this word. We have to study to show ourselves approved unto God, workmen who need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And then we come down this home stretch toward Christmas, a time when people's hearts are sometimes more tender more turned to the things of God. And sure, a lot of it is just sentimentality or going back to the days when they were children themselves. Many people have gotten completely away from the Christmas story as told here, and they only go to the Christmas story as tuned in on television. You and I have to be there, not as a thermometer just going along with what's happening in the atmosphere, but rather to be a thermostat changing the conversation, changing the celebration, calling people to a holy season, to a time of repentance, to a time of coming to understand why Jesus even had to come into the world. Why did Jesus have to die? He had to die because you and I would otherwise be lost. God's unspeakable gift, His greatest gift is our salvation in Christ. He paid a debt that we could never pay. My friend, he took upon himself your sins and my sins. You know, I was called to preach a funeral. I've preached a lot of them in 30 plus years of ministry. But not long ago, I was called to preach the funeral of a friend who called me and said, my sister has died. I know you haven't seen her since she was a little girl, but would you please preach the funeral? They went on to tell me that she had come to know Christ. I did not know for sure one way or the other, and I was biblical, let me put it that way, as I preached that funeral. I didn't make any glossy remarks about where she was, but I made the scriptural truth to those who remained but here's what I know. 
I remembered seeing her the last time when she was about 10 years old, and I was over at my friend's house. We were a few years older, maybe 15 at the time, and I could remember this 10-year-old little sister running around with rosy pink cheeks, looked like a little angel. In fact, her nickname, I believe, was Angel. But when I think about what I saw in the coffin that day, and her family had warned me that she had basically given in to alcohol, that it had gotten the better of her, and she died at a very young age. I looked into that coffin, and I saw her own sin upon her. You know what I'm talking about. You've seen somebody maybe that you haven't seen in a long time, and they've lived a hard life, and that hard life has taken a toll even on their countenance. And what I saw in that coffin, I could hardly believe. When I think the last time I saw her as a little girl with rosy cheeks and such a smile, my friend, here's my point. If that woman's sins, her own sins, had brought such disfigurement upon her, how disfigured do you think our Savior was when he took your sins and my sins and the sins of everyone who places his or her trust in our Savior. Isaiah would say he was so disfigured, he didn't even look human. If you've ever seen pictures of somebody that's been in a wreck and their face is swollen to two or three times the normal size, and they're so disfigured by the beating that they have taken, my friend, the reason that we need God's greatest gift is because we had the sin, the cancer that was eating away at us, and he took it upon himself. I want you to join me next week as we continue talking about God's greatest gift. But I want to pray for you. And as we come into this Christmas season, I pray that it would be the most holy and reverent and Christ-filled Christmas that any of us have ever experienced. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray for everyone watching this program right now that we would take seriously why we need your greatest gift because we were under the curse. We would have been banished from your presence forever and forever without end. And Father, I pray right now for anyone watching this program who does not know you, that they would come out of darkness into your marvelous light and know you as Savior. And for the rest of us, God, I pray that we would be very serious about being ambassadors for Christ and conveying the real reason for Christmas this year. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can contact Duke Duvall at WTJR-TV, 222 North 6th Street, Quincy, Illinois, 62301 or go to his website, www.dukedevall.com. Be sure and join us again next week for Conquering Your Giants.